Hello, my name is Jason Neeson. I'm the owner and creator of Neeson Ireland Tours. So Kilkenny City is a medieval city that's roughly around 90 minutes away from Dublin and our tours would normally uh, start in Dublin. We would normally pick up people like yourselves in your hotel or in your accommodation and then we would transport you down to Kilkenny. Now it is a 90 minutes journey so on the way down to Kilkenny we would normally stop off at a heritage site somewhere that you can stretch your legs and maybe you know get a bit of fresh air and it could be one or two years there are smokers out there and would like a cigarette and that's no problem at all so on the way down we normally stop and give you a little bit of a breather we'll normally get into Kilkenny for about 11 o'clock and then when we get there we normally park the van up and then we go um, towards one of the local cafes that I know of and you always get a cup of tea a scone or some toast always a compliment from Nissan nice Ireland Tours so a great way to start your day so after your mid-morning break your cup of tea or a cup of coffee you can go into the Kilkenny Design and Craft Centre in there you'll find some traditional Irish crafts knitwear paintings jewellery and they give you a good indication of the local artists that are in Kilkenny City you can purchase a gift from here take it home as a souvenir and then at 12 o'clock we normally start our walk and tour in around the streets of Kilkenny where you'll get to learn uh, some of the history from Kilkenny you'll get to see some of the medieval buildings you get to see cathedrals and churches and it's a fantastic little place everything is on walking distance so you don't have to travel too far and normally where we do start our tour is beside Kilkenny um, Castle and then we make our way into the medieval mile we start our walk and tour I will tell you a little bit about Kilkenny and how it got its name. Kilkenny is actually an English name or an anglicised version of the old Irish name. Kill means church, Canis means Canis. Now Canis was the saint, the, the patron saint that go back into the 6th century. He was called Saint Canis. Now St. Canis' monastery was built where St. Canis' cathedral is today and it was built in his honour. So over time, Kiel, which was the church of Canis, became known as Kilkenny. Kilkenny has a population of over 100,000 people and the main uh, population would be in Kilkenny or on the outskirts of it. You also have Thomas Town as well, which is very popular, and Castle Comer. And it was quite accessible to get to other towns because Kilkenny sits on the River Nore. Now it also had this disadvantage because the River Nore brought the Vikings into Kilkenny. And there was many reports of the Vikings coming into Kilkenny and raiding the monasteries and the churches. And also massacring the Irish people. Not too far away there's caves called the Moor Caves. And there's actually a burial site in there of Irish people that were apparently murdered by the Vikings. The landscape in Kilkenny changed dramatically when the Norman invasion arrived in Ireland in 1169. One of the leaders from that um, group of men who came into Ireland was a man called Richard de Clare. Now when he came into Kilkenny he built himself a wooden castle on the site of where the, the concrete or stone castle is today. He built this castle as I said from wood and it was a, it was good defence uh, mechanism but it wasn't uh, any use when he wasn't there. As soon as Richard de Clare went up to Dublin to take control of Dublin, the local Gaelic chieftains in the area decided to burn it to the ground. In the year 1207, Richard de Clare's son-in-law, a man called William Marshall, arrived in Kilkenny and he wanted to build himself a castle on the site of where his father-in-law had previously built his wooden castle. So William Marshall decided he was going to build a stone structure and he was going to build it right on the river in Nor and right at the top of the town looking down towards St. Canis' Cathedral. Now when he built this beautiful stone castle a lot of people would have followed him and they would have lived on the outside of the castle walls and this area then became known as High Town. Down at St. Canis' Cathedral it was known as Irish Town. So the Irish people down there would have called it High Town, actually English Town. So you had an Irish Town and an English Town in Kilkenny. Now William Marshall was a man beyond what people would have expected. He built many abbeys in Ireland. He built a lot of churches. And not only in Ireland was he a builder. He went to Wales and he was building castles, abbeys and cathedrals over there. He was doing exactly the same in England. But also over in Normandy and northern France. 
So we're going to start our tour. We go to the first church, which is called St. Mary's Church, and this has actually been turned into now a museum right in the heart of Kilkenny City. It has 800 years of artifacts, manuscripts, books, uh, deeds, uh, characters. You have then bodies that are in the museum, and you also have some crosses, Celtic crosses from ancient times. Now we're not going to be able to go through all of the artifacts that are inside the medieval uh, Moyle Museum, but I'll show you a short video clip that is put together from the museum itself, so they take all the credit for this video that's going to come up. Museum is actually inside the church of St. Mary's. Now this church has been desecrated since 1950 so it's no longer used as a place of worship. The council took it over and then eventually was turned into this beautiful museum that we have here in Kilkenny. Outside in the graveyard there's many many different graves and tombs and this would have been a graveyard that merchant families would have been buried in. So the word tossle comes from an old English word or an old English meaning uh, that means collecting taxes. So this building would have been used for making uh, laws and collecting taxes like a revenues office. Today it's used as the Lord Mayor's office and inside you would have the sword and mace that the Lord Mayor would use for opening ceremonies or meeting dignitaries. It also has a lot of important documents, even a document called the Charter which King James I gave to Kilkenny. Now the building that we're in here today is actually the third tossel. Uh, the first one was built in 1350 and then the second one was built in around 1580. And this building here today was built in 1782, so about 300 years old. It's made of cut rough limestone. Uh, around the corner we're going to go into one of the little slips. And these slips are small little alleyways where people would have sat in their wares way back in medieval times. There's one called the Butter Slip and another one called the Market Slip. And you know, these stand for their names. One um, slip would have been where people would have sat in butter. The other slip would have been where people sold all type of goods. And when you go down through these lanes, you come out onto a street called St. Kevin Street. St. Kevin runs parallel with High Street. Now we're standing outside Kettler's Inn pub on the famous Kilkenny Strip and this is called St Kevin's uh, Street. It has many many cafes, good few bars here as well but the most famous uh, pub or inn is Kettler's Inn. So there's a story associated with this pub and it's about a woman called Dame Alice Kettler. Dame Alice Kettler was the daughter of a wealthy banker. She inherited the house and she extended the house and made it into this famous inn that it is today. Now, over time, Dame Alice Kettler uh, married four different wealthy men from Kilkenny. And each one of these men died very, very suddenly, and she inherited 
their wealth and their property portfolio. Now word spread on the last husband that John Lepore, uh, our fourth husband, when he was getting really, really sick, um, he went to the bishop and he told the bishop about his illness. Now this bishop was a man called Richard Ledred. And Richard Ledred heard about this dame, Alice Kettler, and he wanted to inquire how all our husbands were dying and how she inherited all this wealth. And she was, you know, probably regarded as one of the most wealthiest women in Ireland from all the inheritance that she got. Richard really dread heard uh, what happened to John Lepore and her other husbands and he accused her of witchcraft and then he wanted to um, charge her on witchcraft and this sentence would have been death. That's basically what it was. If you believed of anything else outside of the Catholic faith you were gonna get death and Richard Ledred you know pursued this charge he wanted to excommunicate her from the Catholic Church and bring her to court now Alice had wealthy allies and she fled Dublin or fled Kilkenny and went up to Dublin and up there she told her allies about what was going on in Kilkenny Richard Ledred wanted to follow her and he wanted to go to Dublin to bring this to court but he knew that if he left Kilkenny he was probably going to be killed on his journey to Dublin but it took him many many um, attempts uh, to do this and he did travel eventually to Dublin he had to travel at the darkness of night so that he wouldn't be seen eventually the case was held in Dublin and the Lord Chief Justice uh, heard this case about Dame Alice Kettler and he heard about witchcraft and he heard about her four husbands being killed and all the money that she inherited and he wanted to um, you know, dive a little bit deeper into this case. Now Dame Alice Kettler wasn't in court. She decided that she was going to stay hidden. But the Lord Chief Justice heard the case and he actually sided with Richard Ledred. He said, yeah, definitely, you know, there's a bit of witchcraft going on here. So the sentence was that she would be put to death. Not only her, some of our maids, and also our son, William Outlaw. Um, Dame Alice Kettler made her way back down to Kilkenny and she got some of her wealth and she escaped out of Ireland. Now it would have been probably with the help of her allies, maybe her brother-in-law or maybe a, a good, good friend. But either way, she was able to escape Ireland. But unfortunately for our son, William Outlaw, he was actually charged uh, as well with witchcraft and he was sentenced to go to mass. He, the sentence wasn't death, maybe because he was a male. But he was given a sentence that he'd have to go to mass for three times uh, a day. He'd have to feed the poor of Kilkenny. And his other sentence was that he'd have to re-roof uh, St. Callis's roof. So he'd have to put new lead onto the roof. He did so, but it was said that four or five years later, the actual roof collapsed that there was that much lead on it. One of our maids was a, a woman called Petronella of Mead. Now, unfortunately for Petra Mella of Need, who was, you know, regarded as one of Alice's uh, closest friends, she was also sentenced to death for witchcraft. She was accused of making these poor potions, accused of sacrificing animals. And she was actually whipped through the streets of Kilkenny, tied to a horse, and then eventually she was tied to a stake and burnt alive. So a very, very sad end for Petra Nella. But... Wherever Dame Alice Kettler went, she went with her wealth. She had to leave all her property be behind. She only took what she had, maybe jewels or money, but she was never seen again in Kilkenny. But today, the pub is still here, the inn is still here, and when you do come Kilkenny, it's a fantastic place to come for a light, nice meal and a couple of drinks if you, if you fancy that. So we're going to go up the street here, we're going to come to another beautiful uh, building, which is called Road House. So here we are on Parliament Street and right beside us is Road House. Road House was named after the family who actually lived here. There was a family called Road. John Road married a young woman called Anne Archer. She was a local of Kilkenny and her family were very rich and very influential in the running of Kilkenny. So it was a match made in heaven for the two of these people. John Rode imported uh, goods from Asia. He brought in fine clothing, good silks and most expensive clothing. His business would have been ran from this house. It would have been at the front of the building and he would have selling his goods from there. Over time the Rode family grew and grew and he had 12 children. And John Rode decided that he was going to build a uh, bigger house. Now rather than moving from Kilkenny, rather than moving from this location, he built two more houses on the rear of this one house. 
So now what you have is three houses that are three stories tall and it's a large house when you're inside of it. And at the rear of the house they have a big garden also and there's plenty of space there for uh, growing vegetables and for raising animals. So they would have been quite you know, sufficient in looking after themselves here in this plot of land. The family thrived and they made plenty of good connections and made plenty of good money here in the city. But it wasn't until Oliver Cromwell's army arrived into Ireland that things changed for the Rode family. Oliver Cromwell invaded the castle first and then he made his way into the city and from here he expelled all Catholic families. So at the time uh, they were given an option. You could either be killed or you could leave all your worldly possessions behind and head to Connacht. So there was a saying that the invaders uh, said as they marched up the Kilkenny streets and it was basically to hell or to Connacht. So you had two choices, die or leave. And the merchant family, the Rhodes did, they had to leave uh, their, their native Kilkenny behind and they made their way over to County Clare and settled over there. We're going to make our way now down through the old medieval walls and we're going to pass by the Dominican uh, Church and then we make our way around to the Catholic Church which is called St. Mary's Cathedral. So now we're beside St. Mary's Cathedral which is the Catholic Cathedral within Kilkenny. St. Canis's Cathedral is a Church of Ireland Cathedral and it was basically turned into a Church of Ireland Cathedral after the Reformation Act when King, King Henry VIII dissolved all monasteries and churches. He brought in his own religion and the Catholic faith could not be practiced. So St. Canis then took over the role of the Church of Ireland Church and it's still that way and it's still that way today. It wasn't until 1843 when Bishop Kinsley, Bishop William Kinsley, decided that he wanted to build a church in Kilkenny and use it as the main diocese as the cathedral for Kilkenny. Now this was only shortly, 20 years later after Daniel O'Connell had introduced the Emancipation Act which freed Catholics from the oppression of what was at the put upon them way back in the 1560s. Now we could have a place where we could have practice our religion and churches were booming all over Ireland again. The church's first stone, the foundation stone, was laid in 1843 and very, very soon afterwards the Great Famine arrived in Ireland with millions of people being displaced. But throughout this period, the Catholic Church were going around to their local uh, businesses and their local residents and they were still receiving donations even though people were dying of hunger, of starvation and some people just could not afford to give anything. But the majority of people did and the, actually the cathedral started being built. And it took roughly around 14, 15 years for a beat to complete it. In 1857, the church opened its doors and the mass, the very first mass of the day, was held at 6.15 a.m. Now, there was a tradition that had to be completed before you entered the cathedral that morning. First, you stood outside the main door of the cathedral. You walked around the building once, you knocked on the door. You walked around the building for the second time and you knocked on the door. As you walked around the building, the church time and came to the door, you could then enter. It was a ritual that took place and everybody had to do it. Now the cathedral itself is on the highest elevated piece of land within the city. So you can see the cathedral from nearly every direction as you enter. It's 168 foot tall, so it's you know really, really large and impressive. Inside the cathedral, there's many, many altars, many statues. But the main altar that's inside the cathedral uh, was built from Italian marble. It's a beautiful white marble uh, altar. There's many religious statues throughout the cathedral. And one of the most famous uh, statues would be of Our Lady. Our Lady was sculptured by an Italian sculptor named Giovanni Benzoni. Giovanni Benzoni was a famous sculptor and he'd done many uh, sculptures in actually in the Vatican. Another famous sculptor to work within the cathedral was James Pierce. James Pierce was the father of William and Patrick Pierce, who were leaders of the 1916 Rising. Uh, James Pierce sculptured uh, one of the altars on the, the left side of the cathedral. It's a small altar, he done the, the statues and also the altar rail. And uh, we're gonna leave this cathedral now. We're gonna make our way around to St. Canis's Cathedral, and also outside the cathedral is the Round Tower. So let's go over there and we'll have a look at this cathedral. So here we 
here at St. Canis' Cathedral. St. Canis was born in County Derry in the north of Ireland in the year 517. He studied in Wales under St. Caddoch and when he returned to Ireland he studied in a monastery called Clonard which is in County Mead. Now after he was ordained a priest he travelled around Ireland teaching Christianity and he eventually settled in a town called Agabo in County Leash where he built his first church and then he built his next church in County Kilkenny. According to folklore when St. Canis died the two monasteries both wanted to bury St. Canis in their graveyards. So instead of having a disagreement or an argument and you know priests don't do those sort of things uh, they said we will bury them both in our graveyards. So they brought two coffins out of his home and one went to Kilkenny and one went down to Agabo in County Leash. So it's believed that he's buried in two places. Inside the cathedral there are many tombs and effigies and plaques and headstones dedicated to powerful people that came from Kilkenny. You will find that the uh, tomb of the butler's family are inside. You have a headstone belonging to the uh, Kettler's family. And also there's the tomb of the Bishop Richard Lee Dredd, who went after Alice, uh, Dame Alice Kettler uh, to be sentenced to death for her witchcraft. Also inside the cathedral there is a tomb and it is dedicated to a bishop called John Kearney. John Kearney was buried in 1813. Now what's fascinating about this bishop is he is the great 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 grand uncle of the US President Barack Obama. The round tower that stands outside St. Canis' Cathedral is over a thousand years old. It's approximately 100 feet tall, about 30 meters or so. And inside the tower there's 121 steps. And if you're willing to climb these steps, you will get magnificent unspoiled views of County Kilkenny and beyond. These towers were used as a bell tower, so there would have been a call to prayer and also maybe a warning if there was invaders coming up the river or Most of these towers, their entrances would be about 10 to 12 feet off the ground and the reason for this is not because invaders are going to uh, try and get into the tower. It was mainly to make the, the structure of the base of the tower uh, more stronger. So the tower is a, a 100 foot tall, but the base of the tower, where actually the tower sits on the foundation, is only two foot. So magnificent engineering way back in a thousand years ago. And you'll find that with most of these round towers throughout Ireland, that the base or the foundation of the towers is very, very minimal. So after we had our visit into St. Canis' Cathedral and walked up the many steps of the Round Tower, we take a break down for about an hour in, in Kilkenny City. There's many cafes, many restaurants, fantastic taverns, inns and bars that you can get a bite to eat. So there's plenty uh, to choose from. So normally we stop around 2 till 3 o'clock and then at 3 o'clock we continue and we make our way either to your um, Spinnix Experience or into Kilkenny Castle and have a tour there. This stretch of land where the Smithix Brewery is held, it was once belonged to the Franciscan Friary, so it used to be an abbey here at one time. Now it was recorded that these monks that lived in the abbey would have made their own beer. Now they're very, very close to the river north, so they would have been able to get the water from there. And plus all the land that they had, they could grow their own barley and hops. Now it was recorded that these monks also done a lot of fasting, so they wouldn't have any food to eat. But I can guarantee that you were drinking their own beer and most likely they were a little happy amongst going around Kilkenny. It wasn't until 1710 when John Smith actually purchased the land and he opened up his own brewery. Now this brewery is actually recorded as the oldest brewery in Ireland. Guinness wasn't established until 1759, so a good 40 years later. 
It was one of the most important businesses to have in Kilkenny at that time because it employed a large amount of people. These people would have had to harvest the crop, which would have been the um, barley and the hops out in the fields, and they would have had to produce the ale and also transport the ale. You know, it took a lot of uh, hard work on the back of horse and carts and donkeys and the likes to transport this ale around Ireland. Now what's famous about this ale is that it's its colour. It's a, it's a really, really red, amber looking colour ale. And it's, I must say it is quite tasty. Now it wasn't until the mid 1800s when John's grandson, a man called Edmund uh, Smithix, actually took the, the, the brand to a next level. Uh, he actually started transporting the, the ale around the world and the brand got really, really noticeable then. 1964 when the Guinness uh, Corporation, the Guinness Brands, actually bought the Smithix and they now produce the Smithix uh, Ale in their own plants in Dublin in St James's Gate. So not only is the famous Guinness being brewed in there, it's also the famous Smithix as well. So you can still enjoy the Smithix experience when you do come to Kilkenny because the building is still here, you can go inside and you can have a tour of the plants. Uh, by doing so, you get a guided tour of an in-house professional tour guide who has many, many stories that they can let you know about connected to the Smithix family and also to the plants. It's a brilliant, I've done this tour many, many times and it really is a fantastic tour. And at the end of it, you actually get brought into their own Smithix bar and you can sample one of their ales or have a non-alcoholic if you prefer. And after you have sampled one of their uh, beautiful ales, you can go inside into the store and take home a gift or a memorabilia. They've got loads of beautiful clothing, artwork, uh, glasses, very important, and obviously you can buy one or two of their ales. changed um, hands in 1391 when James Butler purchased the castle. Uh, James Butler's ancestors were uh, of Norman descent also. Grandfather was a man called Theobald Fitzwalter and Theobald Fitzwalter came to Ireland with King John the first. After the Norman invasion King John came over to take what was rightly his as he seen it and by his side was a man called Theobald Fitzwalter. So Theobald uh, Fitzwalter's job was actually to pour the first glass of wine for King John the First. And over time the Fitzwalters changed their name to Butler. It wasn't only an act of a servant poured in a glass of wine, no. This peerage, this title also gave you uh, great wealth. The butlers were entitled to 15% tax of all wine that was imported into Ireland. So this made the family very wealthy. And over time the butlers, as they were now known, uh, married you know, extensively into all of the high society families in Ireland. Actually a direct uh, link to a monarch. Queen Elizabeth I is actually a great-great-great-granddaughter 
of one of the butlers called Thomas Butler. The butlers have always had a powerful influence over Ireland and in the 16th century it was no different. James Butler was then the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland and a civil war broke out. Oliver Cromwell was at their beheading King Charles I over in England and he made his way over into Ireland to take control of the land over here. Butler at the time took uh, King Charles I's son, who would later become King Charles II, and went over to France and exiled with him. It wasn't until Oliver Cromwell was actually overthrown again in Parliament that they reinstated King Charles II to become king. In doing so, James Butler was in a very, very favourable position. Not only was he reinstated as Lord Lieutenant, he then became Duke of Ormond. The Butlers would have thrown massive lavish parties in this beautiful castle, and it would have bring in dignitaries and royalties from around the world. The house was full of luxurious furniture, tapestries, art, paintings, wine and the best of foods. Butlers invited over King Edward VII and they had a big lavish party here in the castle and it lasted for about three days. There was over 400 guests so you can just imagine the expense that this would have bring in on the butler's purse. In 1930 they realised that they were running very very low on money and they hadn't got much left. In 1935 they actually went and sold all of the content. Now the bigger pieces like the big tapestries, the carpets and the marble tabletops were all left behind. And it wasn't until 1967 that Arthur Butler actually sold the castle for £50 to the state. Now the state takes control of the castle, it's under the protection of the Office of Public Works, they would look after the castle, the maintenance, the gardens and today the castle is open as a tourist attraction for you and me to come and visit. So after you have taken a tour, whether it was in the Smithing Brewery or whether it was in um, your Kilkenny Castle, there's enough time then to go off shopping and I always allow about an hour or so to do that. If there's plenty of shops here you can go to and the, most of the shops here are all run by locals so you can get some gift souvenirs that you would not normally get in the high streets of like Belfast, Dublin, Galway or Cork. So down here it's quite unique. Um, what I say is about an hour and a half drive down back into Dublin and at that stage then it gives you plenty of opportunity, plenty of time to go out and enjoy the Dublin nightlife. Thank you for watching the full tour, I really appreciate it and if you'd like to share it on social media feel free, it'd be, it'd be fantastic, let people know that there's, these virtual tours are here for you to enjoy. If you'd like to leave a donation please feel free to do so, you can do it on the website. My name is Jason Eason from Neeson Ireland Tours and I thank you for watching my virtual tour of Kilkenny.